Welcome to the MetaSense webinar on the future of pain management and specifically nociception level monitoring. I am Frank Overdyke, Professor of Anesthesiology in Charleston, South Carolina, and I will start with, the, with an introduction into nociception technology for MetaSense and why there is a need for objective payment assessments in and out of the operator room. I call that the missing link. By way of relevant disclosures, I serve as medical uh, director for MetaSense, the company that developed NOL and brought it to market. I'm also a consultant for Medtronic in several cap uh, capabilities. So the lecture title suggests we're going to talk about the missing link of monitoring. So let's start with the intraoperative period, which is our bread and butter as anesthesiologists. We are taught that our job is to take care of three domains of general anesthesia, namely analgesia, hypnosis, and muscle relaxation. The first of these domains to get an objective model uh, uh, monitor was muscle relaxation. In the 1970s, Hassan Ali and his colleagues at Mass General in Boston developed the train of full monitor. It helps us get an objective measure of neuromuscular blockade, which is still very relevant in 2020 with residual blockade in the PACU. Then in the 1990s, we got a hypnosis monitor or depth anesthesia monitor, the BIS monitor also developed in Boston. And as reluctant as some of us were to accept that we needed the depth of anesthesia monitor, most of us have come to appreciate the BIS monitor as a very useful adjunct to general anesthesia, in special cases, if not in all cases. But the domain that remains a challenge is to objectively titrate analgesia and opioids specifically. Most of us take great pride in our skill to titrate opioids to signs and symptoms. But to be honest, we don't get it right all the time and we could use an objective monitor just like we use the train of four or the BIS. So before we talk about null technology, we need to review some terminology because the definitions are very specific. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And notice the words unpleasant, emotional and potential. It sounds almost like psychiatry not physiology. But the definition implies that pain can only be experienced in the awake state of consciousness. So a patient must be verbal or communicative to be able to report their pain. So we just said our first challenge was to find an objective pain monitor for patients under anesthesia. That's not correct. The correct term is we're finding a nociception monitor. Nociception is the process that encodes a noxious stimulator from a nociceptor. And I like to think of pain and nociception in terms of a Venn diagram. Not all pain is nociception and not all nociception is pain. For instance, the pain of losing a loved one does not involve nociception. And similarly, the guy walking over the hot coals on YouTube has a lot of nociceptors firing, but does not experience pain. The challenges with opioidocin are well known. There's a 20 to 30 fold variability in opioid plasma levels and opioid effect between patients given the same dose of opioid. So if I gave everyone in this virtual conference room 10 milligrams of morphine IV, there would be a 20 to 30 fold difference in effect. So to rely on a weight based dosing scheme is really quite silly. We call that personalization of drug dose and Dr. Kuklenberg will show us later that null can do a much better job with personalization of opioid dosing than our primitive weight-based dosing schemes. And of course, complicating our opioid dosing is the interaction between hypnotics and opioids that we see here in the dose response curve superimposed on the right. We always need to find the optimal combination of the two to achieve the desired effects yet minimize side effects. And that is this area with the green circle. And lastly, we're all aware that the explosion of, of opioid misuse and tolerance has created a real dosing challenge for us, not only intra-op, but in the PACU and post-op as well. So I've alluded to why even I, who considers myself an expert in opioid dosing, may want an objective monitor of nociception to help me dose opioids intra-op. On the left, you see the consequences of underdosing opioids. Unstable hemodynamics, likely hypertension, tachycardia, which are never good for our patients with coronary vascular disease. Postoperative pain makes for prolonged PACU stays, poor organ perfusions, unhappy patients, 
and potentially longer term consequences such as chronic pain and opioid dependence. We think more precise opioid dosing may help reduce PACU and hospital discharge. We know fewer opioid prescriptions post-op will lower opioid dependence. That's been shown in the literature. And we hope that null guiding may help contribute to that. On the right, we have the consequences of overdosing opioids, the most serious being my academic, academic interest, which is respiratory depression, as well as hypotension and the other side effects of opioids we all well know well, nausea, vomiting, ileus, ureter retention, etc. Patients may also stay in the PACU longer. So underdosing and overdosing is bad for patients, it's bad for efficiency. So we know that pain and nociception both activate the sympathetic nervous system. Pupils dilate, breathing and heart rate pick up, blood vessels constrict, sweating occurs. Many of the parasympathetic functions such as bowel mutility, digestive enzyme secretion are turned down. So null captures signals from several of these sympathetically activated organ systems. Now here we have the null, the null transducer. Uh, it looks a lot like a bulky pulse, pulse oximeter. I call it the Tesla of index finger transducers because it does a lot of cool stuff. It measures the photopleth. It measures galvanic skin response, which is a fancy way of saying it measures skin conductance as it changes as the body sweats. It has the ubiquitous accelerometer. Let's talk about for a few minutes what null monitor does with these signals and how the null index is derived. So in the operating room, Dix underwent elective surgery with fentanyl or remifentanyl as the opioid and null data was collected. The finger probe parameters we've seen are skin conductance, pleth amplitude, heart rate, heart rate variability. These are the ones you just saw on the transducer were input to the model and the best relationship between each of these parameters and the combined index of stimulation, or the CESA, was explored. The combined index of the CESA is the stimulation intensity graded from one to 10. For example, an intubation might be a six, a skin suture might be a three, minus the effect of the opioid calculated from the effect site concentration from the PKPD curves. How well did each of these parameters distinguish between a, the noxious stimulus and a non-noxious stimulus as measured by a rock curve? And here are the results of that analysis. On the right, you see each individual parameter. So you see SCL as skin conductance, PA as pleth amplitude. And you see that those individually didn't do such a good job in terms of predicting noxious and non-noxious. You see that heart rate in purple did a better job Heart rate variability did even slightly better job. That's the green dotted line. There are monitors that use some of these parameters, but the, the combination of these parameters, the multi-parameter function that did a really good job was the, the null, the aggregate of these. So let me just spend a couple of minutes explaining the random forest algorithm. It is a supervised classification algorithm. So uh, what you see here, um, each input variable from our transducer makes a note of a decision tree. We see heart rate here, pleth amplitude, skin conductance. For example, here we only have two levels of the branches of our tree, but obviously the null tree has a lot more branches, had 10 plus input variables. To train this algorithm as to what pain looks like and what pain doesn't look like, we walk down these nodes. For instance, a heart rate, let's say we have a point in time where we had a heart rate less than 95, we had a pleth amplitude less than 0.5, and that correlated with mild pain. So that is one point in time. Now we develop another point in time. Here we had five minutes later, the heart rate might have been greater than 95, the skin conductance might have been greater than 20, and there was severe pain, there was a high skeezer score. So you can see as we do this, these are all the points in time are added. And what these look like, they look like trees. And if you, you teach this algorithm over and over again, it starts to look like a forest. It's called the random forest algorithm for that reason. And it can do a very good job in terms of developing this null index. Let's look at the monitor itself with the scale. Absence of nociceptive responses and null index of zero. 
extreme nociceptive response is a null index of 100. Um, as with any case, we need to pick a threshold or a cutoff value. In the case of null optimization of the clinical data gave us a null of 25. So you're looking for a target between uh, less than 25 but greater than zero, uh, be perhaps between 10 and 25. Something to remember here that just like with pulse oximetry, the trends and the patterns of the null are very useful. As surgery progresses, you get a feeling for the reactivity of the patient to stimuli as you see the null curve and you spot upward and downward trends. So it's really null is continuous. Null, of course, cannot anticipate stimuli just like BIS doesn't anticipate it, but it's very helpful in terms of the trends. There is a good body of uh, literature that will explain uh, the, the, the validation, the verification of the, null, of the null algorithm, and you can read that here. What about the clinical value proposition for null in the operating theater? We talked about how null will likely make over and under analgesia less likely, and there's opioid dosing safer, especially in high-risk and opioid-tolerant patients. Dr. Kuklenberg will talk about the personalization of the dose of dosing with null, and Dr. Daham will show us that the hemodynamics of a null controlled case are more stable and smooth, and that the pain outcomes can be improved. There are some very interesting case studies that show that the proper placement of regional anesthesia, including epidurals, tap blocks, and intercostal blocks, can be verified using null. So you place the block. We typically don't know whether the block works. We look at hemodynamics but actually now you have a null monitor that can tell you when there's a stimulus, whether that stimulus is blunted by your block. And you may wonder how a monitor derived and validated from an opioid-based anesthetic can be used with opioid-free anesthesia. But remember, null measures the sympathetic response to noxious stimuli, which are blunted by all classes of analgesics. And Dr. Kuklenberg will talk a little bit about dexmatomidine. Before I hand the mouse over to Dr. Dahan, I want to talk about null in the ICU, which is sadly a very relevant topic these days. In the ICU, we have patients with varying levels of consciousness that we must monitor, from this fellow on the left, who looks like he is wide awake and a little stressed and can have pain by definition, to the young lady on the right, who is heavily sedated and may actually have some sleep apnea by the looks of her snoring. So let's start about some facts about pain management in an ICU, or should I say management in nonverbal, mechanically, uh, mechanically ventilated ventilator patients. Pain is one of the factors that cause agitation in ventilated patients in the ICU. That's a fact. Agitation is a risk factor for delayed extubation in critically ill patients. Optimizing pain control, therefore, may help reduce agitation and decrease mechanical ventilation duration in the ICU. Pain assessment in mechanically ventilated patients is independently associated with a reduction in duration of ventilator support. And we, we can give you these references, but this is well established. So there's a reason that the Society for Clinical Care Medicine recommends that pain and sedation be assessed separately and that pain be assessed first, independently of sedation and treated first. And one way they recommend that is through a, a scale, a CPOT scale or something like that, uh, which is a, 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 a scale for non-commutative patients. Fortunately, uh, recently in pain management nursing, we, there was a study published that showed that the CPOT scale correlated very closely with null and that null was a good surrogate measure for that. So now we have a way of continuously measuring pain in these ICU patients. Obviously, in this day and age, COVID and mechanically ventilated patients is a real problem. And these patients spend a lot of time intubated. Anything we can do to reduce that duration of ventilation by decreasing agitation, improving pain th therapy is good. Patients with COVID are also at accelerated risk of delirium, at least two to seven factors, two of which are the effect of sedative and pain strategies, and again, prolonged mechanical ventilation. So in the ICU, null may help prevent under-analgesia and over-analgesia, hopefully decreasing a duration of mechanical ventilation and all some of these longer acting uh, problems. The Spanish Society of Critical Care actually recommends 
uh, the, the null monitor as one of the strategies for getting a handle on pain. This is an ICU from uh, Israel in, in COVID patients. Of course, there's a whole range of other applications that we could consider, but we, are, we have started with the most obvious. Thank you very much.